explorations, probing global diversification. We travel the world so you don't have to. Hi, and welcome to Explorations. Today we have Debbie Danbrook of Toronto. She's the first woman shakuhachi player, and she's going to tell us all about how she got started and about her trip to Japan. So with me today, Debbie Danbrook, shakuhachi flute player. Um, I guess the first thing to ask is, I mean, uh, uh, on your website, I, uh, uh, you, you, it says that, that you are the first woman to become a, um, a master shakuhachi player. Um, what, uh, what was it about uh, the shakuhachi that uh, attracted you in the first place, or how did you get involved with it? Well, I had played flute all my life and enjoyed different types of music with the flute, classical music. Um, we did a lot of performance art in Vancouver and then really got into jazz in Montreal. But I had a gig out in Vancouver and there was a performer there for a dance performance. And after the first note of hearing shakuhachi, my heart just sang and I knew that was my flute after that first note. And within almost just about a week later, I was in Japan. I just went to learn my flute. Really? Um, so that was your influence, was just the, the fact that you heard the flute and, and boom, you're over there? Um, what kind of research did you do in that week before, uh, before you went over to, 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 to know what you were getting yourself in for? Well, actually, I'm kind of glad that we didn't have the internet and all the resources at that time because I just jumped. I got got my ticket. I went. I arrived in Japan, and it was here. I am. How do I find a teacher? Now that was the difficult part because um, there aren't a lot of there aren't a lot of shakuhachi players. It, it is a very specialized thing, but women don't play, and the Japanese people were so lovely to me, but. They were too polite to actually sit me down and say, Debbie, uh, women are not strong enough to be able to play shakuhachi. So I, I did have trouble finding a teacher. What do you mean by strong enough? Do you need a certain physical strength to play it? No, not at all. Um, shakuhachi is a very different uh, instrument than almost any other instrument I've ever played. It's much different than any regular flutes. When you play the shakuhachi, it can sometimes take you months to get a single sound. And it has nothing to do with physical strength because I'm, I'm not a big person. I don't have big, strong lungs. It has to do with your energy field and it has to do with transmitting energy. So the shakuhachi is a spiritual tool more than a musical instrument. Hmm, interesting. Uh, so how hard was it then to learn? How long did it take you? You say uh, sometimes it takes weeks just to get one sound. How, how long did it take you to, to get to the point where you consider yourself proficient? Well, I don't know if you believe in past life experiences. Well, I hadn't really thought of it that much until that point in my life when I lived in Japan. But when I picked up that flute, I could play it. And not only could I play it, but as I started to learn the traditional Zen pieces, I could play them. So I wasn't learning them. I was re remembering. So that, that first piece that I learned, um, which is a, a beautiful Honkyoku piece, which are the traditional pieces that the Zen monks used to play, I learned in a couple of weeks. And it wasn't really till I came back to Canada and I was teaching here, um, teaching Shakuachi at University of Toronto. And I had a really good group of students. They were uh, committed students. They're musicians. A lot of them had meditation background that I realized it takes a year to learn that piece that I learned in a couple of weeks. So I really was reconnecting with Shakuhachi. That's why it had such a strong pull for me, such an impact the first time I heard it. And it was also an impetus to get me to Japan. I'd always wanted to live in Japan. And so I got to live there for three years during that period. And uh, <laughs> how has your opinion of Japan changed uh, because of that experience? Oh, I love Japan. My heart is in Japan. I found a temple where it's it's my spot on the planet. I love my temple there. And every day I have pictures here at my altar and I go to my temple in meditation. But uh, living in Japan was the most 
fantastic thing and the hardest thing. Like Japan is wild. I don't know if you've been, but it is so unique. There are so many unique places on the planet, but Japan has amazing energy. The most spiritual places like my temple and then this wild energy downtown. So many people, so much movement, so much going on. So uh, living in Japan transformed my life. The shakuhachi was the key, the doorway I needed for my spiritual journey. So I love Japan. I love it. <laughs> so tell us about the flute. How how big is it? How is it made? It's. I can show you here. Okay. See, it, it's um, a very big piece of bamboo. And I don't know if you can see on the bottom there, the size yeah, yeah. of the bamboo. Most bamboo flutes are quite tiny. You could practically just snap them. But this is a very heavy flute. And there's some, there is some wild history with it that was actually used as a weapon. But that's that's a whole different story. But <laughs> I, of course, am using it as a spiritual tool. So it's this special kind of bamboo that, again, um, like so many woods on our planet, it's getting harder and harder to find. And then uh, a craft, it is crafted over months and months. Um, the, the bamboo actually has to sit for, for a year or so to, just to dry out. But you get a shakuhachi maker who's a master maker. And each flute has a different feeling, a different frequency. And there are five holes, four on the front and then one on the back. And he adjusts each of these holes to make this flute resonate with its own frequency. So they're a work of art. They're just incredibly beautiful. It is a nice looking instrument. Um, the flute is used in meditation, as you mentioned, and in healing. Do the materials uh, that it's made of lend themselves to uh, um, uh, it being used in meditation and healing? I think so, because when we're picking up a piece of bamboo and then we're we're pouring our spirit, our feeling, our, our frequency into it, it's like, for me, that bamboo comes alive when I play it. And my frequency and the frequency of the bamboo become one. Uh, what about uh, the ritual aspect of, of learning and playing the flute? Does that lend itself to uh, uh, the spiritual side of, of, of things, to the healing and, and meditation? Yes, I think if you look at the lineage of shakuhachi, it goes back, um, it was an oral tradition. So a teacher would play a, a piece and the student would uh, accept that piece from the teacher and then pass it on that way. Now the music is written and so you get maybe 50% of what the piece is from the written part, but it's still very much an oral tradition where so often in our in our classical um, teaching, we, we rely 100% on the music and um, less in the feel the feel so there's there's a feel that's passed on through shakuhachi but i think also what what i'm trying to do with the shakuhachi is to get way back to the original roots of it and when you think of bamboo the roots of the bamboo go deep into the earth and out in all directions and they bring up that energy of the earth and when i play shakuhachi that's exactly what i try and do bring up the energy of the earth so that my heart can be as open as it can be uh, the idea of the power behind the flute, how does that, how does that influence and, and, and make you feel as a player? And then I guess as a listener as well, uh, you've obviously uh, experienced it as a listener before you learned and, and now you're playing it yourself. What, what does it do to you? When I hear shakuhachi, my heart sings. It's like my heart just opens up. And if you have any um, understanding or, or anything about um, the energy field around our body, our heart chakra is right at the center and our heart is for love and for relationship. And this shakuhachi, uh, the sound and the feeling from the shakuhachi, I think has a, a unique quality where it can really go into our hearts and help to open our hearts. And the more our hearts are open, the more loving we are to ourselves and to everyone around us. So shakuhachi is amazing. Sounds like uh, you're into it. Now, um, you've <laughs> you've um, also taken it and used it in collaboration with other musicians, taken it beyond just the, uh, the its, its basic function, I would say. Um, how has it affected your associations with other musicians and people? I think people um, outside of Japan respond to shakuhachi in a, in a very kind of visceral way. They they hear it and they're they're, they're moved by it. When I play, uh, especially when I was living in Japan and playing, people have a connotation of shakuhachi being something kind of old fashioned. Whereas because we don't have that connotation of a cultural background, when we hear shakuhachi. We, People just love it. And musicians and uh, working recording studios, everyone just loves it. They love 
recording it. They love hearing it. They love playing along with it. So I love to collaborate. And uh, Shakuhachi, and I also sing, my voice sounds quite a bit like my flute, actually. But I love collaborating and playing with other people and just seeing what emerges from that creative impetus. Now, from your website and reading about uh, your uh, biography and whatnot, uh, it seems like you've used this in so many different situations, and, and we were just talking about uh, playing with other players as well. Do you have any uh, specific stories about situations you've been involved in that stand out in your mind uh, during your shakuhachi experiences? Oh, a million. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Uh, well, the, just uh, two weeks ago, I guess, was I was in Japan. I do a little uh, tour every year for cherry blossom time when the whole country turns pink and white with cherry blossoms. And I was there playing in my temple and uh, had a small group. And my niece was there, which was very sweet for me. And she took pictures. And so playing in my temple is always a very heart opening spot for me. But I think one of the most amazing things was... Um, um, playing in Ottawa, do you know the Museum of Civilization? Yeah. They have they have a beautiful Zen garden there, oh, and wow. I was invited to play at the opening. And the prince and princess from Japan were there, and it was raining, and they were holding umbrellas over the prince and princess and over me as I played by this beautiful Zen garden. And that moment is is always so strong in my heart. Hmm. Now, I understand they actually have shakuhachi festivals, which I think is an in intriguing idea. What happens at these? You get people wandering all over the streets playing the flute. Uh, what, what goes on? It's, it's an amazing experience. The first I went to the first one in Japan, and it was up a mountain. And in Japan in the summer, the heat is unbelievable and the humidity. <clears throat> Excuse me. And just thinking about it, I can... Uh, you can feel that heat. And there were 200 of us playing just the low note on the shakuhachi, playing a low D. And to be in a group of that many shakuhachi players just playing one sound, it felt like you were swimming in the sound. And that, that I felt that that 20 minutes just transformed me. It was beautiful. But the, the next one was in uh, Colorado, in Boulder. And I was invited to perform, and I was the only woman playing shakuhachi at that festival. There were women there that were studying, but I got to get up in front of 200 uh, players, mostly men, and to play my what 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 I feel is um, very much the spiritual roots, the kind of the uh, the spiritual connection with our angels. To play that for those men was an amazing, amazing play. The fact that you're the only woman playing often uh, does that. Do you feel centered out, or do people respect you as 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 a player? Yes, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, a, a lot of that feeling has disappeared. That it's oh, it's just you know something people do for a hobby, an uh, old cultural thing. I played at Expo in Japan. I guess I don't know eight years ago or whatever, and there were shakuhachi players came specifically to hear me. So things have changed. Yeah, are changing. You play for things like music energy clearings. I, I, I'm trying to picture what that is. And, and you've played in so many interesting situations. Uh, who would typically use your services in this, in this uh, kind of example? Well, it's really interesting the people that are attracted to the shakuhachi. A lot of people that come already have a background in meditation, energy healing, um, all the all these different things. Uh, but some people just hear shakuhachi and they love it. And so I have people come to my music meditations where they get to lie on the floor and uh, they've never done anything like this before, I know. But they come because they love shakuhachi. But I, I do all sorts of, I play at conferences, you know, I play at different concerts. Our, our latest CD, Light from the Super Earth, is quite jazzy. And we, we released that here in Toronto at the Jazz Bistro. So the Shakuhachi lends itself to many different um, venues and events. But always, for me, it's that feel of, feeling of offering the, the spiritual side of it, the, the healing and the light that comes through in the music for me. So considering its uh, spiritual nature, are, are you a religious person? You're obviously a spiritual person, but are you religious? Do you, what, what do you bring to the table that way? I would say I'm a very spiritual person, but not a religious person. Um, this, my spiritual journey is my unique Debbie Danbrook spiritual journey. And so um, I, I have so many spiritual leaders or situations where I feel that I'm, I'm learning, but I feel that I have to find my journey. And the flute has been the key for me to carry me straight down or maybe 
winding down that road of my spiritual journey. Do you play any other instruments? Oh, sure. I started on piano, so I play key- keyboards. Um, I had a, sh- an, a shoulder injury and s- at some point, and I had to stop playing shakuhachi for a year, so I, I really got into singing. So now I'm singing as much as I'm playing shakuhachi. I play the koto, the Japanese harp. I play different percussion, um, some other things, but shakuhachi is the best. <laughs> Um, meditative music in general, I mean, when we listen, I like listening to it. It's uh, very relaxing and, and perhaps the nature of it, it's typically slow, moody, ethereal. It, it, you know, I guess the idea is that it's supposed to center you somehow. But um, And I actually have a couple of uh, Shakuhachi CDs from past uh, people. I've been listening to it for years. Uh, um, but, but but what about the nature of, of, sh- of meditative music? I mean, could you theoretically have heavy metal sh- shakuhachi meditative music hmm, heavy metal i'm not i mean i'm using heavy metal as you know as a as a metaphor for for any kind of music that is above and beyond ethereal well there there's different levels of meditation there's meditation where we're where we're sitting and we're we're really calm and centered and uh, being very open but there's also healing music that we can use in our daily lives that helps us keep in a calm and centered place where we still have to do our tasks and i think that music can be used much more than i think we've lost lost so much in the ability to have music to help regulate our lives and help enhance our lives so some of my music i think is specifically just very nice just to sit there and you know light a candle and do whatever kind of meditation but for so many people like to take that five minutes or ten minutes is really difficult but to have some healing music as they go about their daily tasks or driving or whatever, I think can help people so much, can really help calm us down. Do you ever have to take time off for music? No. No? Okay. <laughs> I know some people, I mean, I, I do a little bit of music myself too. I try anyway. And and, and um, after I've put a few songs together, sometimes I, I listen to it so much that I need to sort of back off a little bit and maybe come back and revisit it a little bit later um, after I've had some time to sort of breathe. Um, you don't You don't encounter that kind of situation. Well, I've done 20 CDs and each... Each one is is its own little journey. And so some of them, I've just gone in and the music has just flowed through me and just kind of poured through in a few days. Um, other ones, especially when you're collaborating with people, they can take longer. And they so you'll work on a piece and then you'll let that go and work on another piece. So I find each, each uh, recording s- session is different. Each CD is different. And they're all, they're kind of like the little uh, crossroads of my life, like what's been going on in my life at that time. So each one is different, but take a break. But when you said take a break from music, I thought you meant like, don't listen to anything. I'm like, no, I have to listen to music. I love it so much. I have to say that, um, some years ago when I was working in um, uh, rock radio as a, as a DJ, um, I was playing a lot of music that I didn't particularly enjoy. And I have to be honest that it actually turned me off of music. And I didn't listen to any music for about a year. And that scared me. And, and I had to get out of it. I had to go into a completely different um, walk of life in terms of earning my money. So, um, you know, I, I, I guess it can happen. But I, I suppose it depends. Like if you're doing something that you truly enjoy uh, then it's not as difficult as 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 when you're doing something that you're fighting that you want to say well this is garbage but boy is that ever sound good you know oh well actually i can relate to that because when i was studying at university and very immersed in in silver classical food um, it started, I, I, again, I didn't know about shockers, but I had this horrible feeling in my heart and I started to dislike music and it wasn't the music I was playing. It was the environment and, you know, very competitive and you're doing scales, hours and hours of scales. So I walked away from music at that point and went down to the Bahamas to work on boats. Didn't know I was really seasick and <laughs> uh, ended up on a desert island because every boat I got on mysteriously broke. So I took a break from music. I, yeah, but that was like a, that was a, a different kind of feeling thing, and that that was for about about a year. It was six months on the desert island down there. So, so it turned so, into an adventure and a learning experience, I guess. Yes, and then I came back and got into jazz and all sorts of different kinds of music, and then 
shakuhachi. <laughs> <laughs> so just a quick uh, a review of your uh, CDs. Uh, um, you've obviously uh, got quite a body of work with 20 CDs. Um, how, how do you feel your music has evolved over the years, the, the stuff that you've been writing and doing yourself? And maybe afterwards, we can just get briefly into your latest release. That, that's interesting because um, I recorded before Shakuhachi, but the music that I recorded with Shakuhachi trans Shakuhachi has transformed me. So I feel that the music I play I play with Shakuhachi is ha, is a different me than before Shakuhachi. So um, of course the CDs have moved and expanded, and, and the latest one I'm just so thrilled with it in so many ways. But I love them all. I love them all. And I, I listen to Debbie Danbrook every day. <laughs> so, really? oh, yes. I, yeah. So it's, it's, mu it's timeless music. It's, and, and I don't write it. It's always um, like what I'll play for you today is just, I just open my heart and it's what comes through. So the music isn't written. A couple of times because we've been collaborating with people, we've had to have some charts and, you know, do some back stuff before they came in. But on the whole, it's just, we just play, and and the people that I collaborate collaborate with are, are enjoy that kind of music too. So we just play. So just tell so, us briefly uh, about your latest uh, CD. You mentioned that it has jazz elements in it. It's called Light from the Super Earth. Um, any differences, or as you say, I mean, if it just pours out of you, uh, uh, that's pretty amazing, actually. Well, this one was was incredible. It's with David Darling, an amazing cellist. He came up from the States to record here. And we went into the studio for three days and just played and played and played. And we did have a, a few things, you know, mapped out just just to, to use our time as well as we could. But boy, we, we unbelievable amount of, during those sessions. And then that music, uh, my, my, uh, I've, all the CDs have been engineered by Steve Steve Raymond, uh, uh, engineered but produced, and he's amazing. And the way he he shaped and molded that, and all the people involved, and the final thing was it was taken over to England, and it was mastered by Tim Young, who mastered the Beatles Love CD. So it has Beatles Love music feeling in it too. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Uh, and you're you're under a sort of a, a more general title called Healing Music. Tell me about that. To me, healing music is um, embodies all types of music, not just music uh, for meditation, but music that helps calm us, music that it, it can calm and energize us too. So we, we don't want to be completely like blah. We want to have energy but stay centered so and grounded so um different cds for different people for different situations um there's music there that people have used for birth there's uh cds that people have uh, sacred sounds for the soul is the one i wrote for my dad when he needed to die when he was 98 and so that people are using that in palliative so different cds different situations um different things going on in our lives uh, can you just uh, tell us about the website? Just promote it briefly. Uh, what, how how people could access it? Uh, it's just www. It's healingmusic. com. And then oh. you're sort of a subcategory in, in in that on the internet anyway. Yeah, so just look for healingmusic.com, and uh, I also have debbiedanbrook.com will take you there. And lightfromthesupereearth.com has its very own website. There's a beautiful, beautiful video there under the media button that Chris Gartner did. It's one of my favorite videos. So we gave it its own website because it's the newest CD. So <laughs> yeah. I've heard it. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. And thanks for talking to us. Fantastic. Oh. Thank you so much for having me, and, and it was just, just lovely. Thank you. Lots of luck. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, Debbie. For more information about Debbie, please go to her website at debbiedanbrook.com or healingmusic.com. For Explorations, I'm Nina Hilger. <laughs>